Welcome back to Tea Time at Birkin Monastery. And we will get right into the questions. Ajahn, our first question is from Jean D. in Forestville, USA. Ajahn, in the past year, my family, like millions of families, experienced several deaths, none of them due to COVID. As I go about the day, sometimes feelings of sadness and loss arise and are often quickly shunted aside as I carry on or to avoid tearing up in public. In the quiet of meditation, when touched by warm and friendly attention, these feelings flower and fade. I do not want to avoid or resist or squelch these natural feelings and also do not want to cling to them. Does metta include patiently bearing with the unpleasant? Is this an act of friendliness towards oneself? Any guidance would be welcome. Well, this is, you have to make up your, your mind, dear. Um, do you want to experience metta or not? <laughs> and if uh, sadness and uh, unwanted emotions flood up, you have to decide, do you want to indulge them or not? Now, you're referring to them as natural these natural emotions well up and flower, etc. And I do not want to squelch them. Uh, a, well, if they're positive feelings, if they're warm feelings of, of loving kindness, um, then fine. But if they're negative feelings, then uh, why would you be hesitant to, to dismiss them or replace them? Now, this is, this is the great confusion of our entire idea of the mind and the emotional structure, perhaps in the modern West. Uh, who knows what the history of this is, but this there's a kind of a warning in the culture. Don't repress your emotions. Don't suppress this. Just experience it, all of this kind of stuff. This is very different from the language of the Buddha. Buddha is very much for getting right in there and changing things and not, re, not uh, treasuring, just because it's, it's your mind or some memory that you have, not just uh, treating it sentimentally. And it's not dangerous to do this, to change your own mind, to decide what you want to think and how you want to feel is not dangerous. It is not repression. It is not suppression. And uh, the idea of that you're avoiding the truth or avoiding yourself or something is not the way we think of it in, in the Buddhist terms. We are really just retraining this thing, the brain, the mind, we're retraining it. So it works in a way that uh, we desire it to. And so we should not be um, afraid to decide that there's certain th types of thoughts that we we do not wish to have, and there's certain types of thoughts that we do wish to have. Now, this is this is a reference to the to the Buddha himself. He said, "When I when I was a bodhisattva before my enlightenment, he was investigating the nature of the mind, and he decided. He said, I will make." two heaps of thoughts. One, which is unskillful, unwanted, <clears throat> which leads to no good, and another that is desirable, good, and which I have no regrets over. And he made these, he sort of made lists of types of thoughts that he did not think were beneficial, did not appreciate, did not help him, and made lists of kinds of thoughts that he ne would never regret that they're very pleasant. And he decided, I shall not think the thoughts in the akusala pile. The other day we talked about akusala, meaning unskillful pile, and I shall only dwell on the thoughts in the kusala uh, pile, the kusala categories. And so he said, I, I made a conviction, a st strong conviction, of doing this, and I endeavored, and I succeeded, and it worked. And the, the only thing he said is that beyond that, after I found that uh, it was much better than allowing a jumble of random thoughts to arise just because they happen to arise doesn't mean that I 
that they benefit me. So now I have thoughts which benefit me. Now, but even <clears throat> thinking all day long can be tiresome. Even pleasant thoughts. One wishes a, a, a rest from all of this thinking itself. So then he proposed that he would try to be fully conscious, awake, uh, feeling well and peaceful, but not thinking. So then he moves towards what we call the noble silence or the jhana, the deep samadhi concentration. And he said that's even better than thinking uh, positive, beneficial thoughts. So that's the description. So that's what you're, you're going to have to override the customary voice that we hear in, in psycholo pop psychology, I suppose, or just the general uh, way we speak in, uh, in the, the West and in, in our present society about, you know, just dealing with all these upwelling thoughts and, uh, and being afraid to change them or suppress them or et cetera. This is just not on the agenda of uh, the Buddha. He says, do dismiss, replace, uh, prevent whatever is necessary for these unwholesome, regrettable types of thoughts which are connected with emotions. Change the channel with uh, extreme prejudice and replace them with positive ones that you could never regret having. So this is the straightforward advice, and it it di disagrees somewhat with our the whole philosophy of the of the modernity. So take your choice. You can do one or the other, but you can't do both. <laughs> you're going to trust the wisdom of the Buddha, or are you going to trust somebody who graduated from university with a bachelor of psychology that just thought up a a new idea about the about the mind? Which one? <laughs> Our next question is from Sujata in Seattle, United States. Sujata, please ask Ajahn your question. I'm wondering about metta for objects or natural elements. Um, so on Christmas Eve day, I went to the mountains to be in the snow for a couple of hours, like I would go snowshoeing at Birkin. And I practiced metta for the people I came across cross but nothing felt very different or strong then when i was by myself i reflected on the snow and why i was drawn to go see it and i reflected on ajahn jody paulo's beautiful nature videos and your discussion of the beauty of snow and this was followed by a flood of unconditional metta for snow <laughs> And I actually felt I could see it in a whole new way down to its elemental form. And I delighted in every aspect of it and felt a lot of joy. I felt lightness and relaxation in my body and my mind. Um, I did move on to feel a similar state. So don't worry, I did move on to people <laughs> on Christmas day, at least for some periods of time, which started with my cat and the birds outside my window, and then people, and especially friends. I appreciated you pointing out that this was a dwelling place, um, not just a feeling. And that if we've been practicing sila, we sometimes had to just crack the window and let it in. So that was really helpful. And I am just so appreciative for you helping me to redo my scaffolding over the years too, because that was, a helpful image and I feel like I really have done that. Um, so why might snow have been easier to start out with than people or beings? Right. Well, nature itself, um, first of all, snow, of course, is a beautiful casino, the white casino. And uh, at the same time, you'll see in uh, Jyoti Palo's uh, videos, that he, he always says, and people say that snow is white, <laughs> but the, the snow is full of all kinds of colors, and it's when we allow ourselves to look at nature that we see the beauty in it. But it's a neutral subject, so it, it doesn't have a lot of uh, strong uh, kind of perceptions around it as humans do. <clears throat> so we can start there, and that's why often people find peace and 
uh, joy in nature. One of the things that allows uh, loving kindness to arise is when one's own uh, emotional structure is not experiencing affliction. So we go out into nature and we forget about the human, the, the, the friction of the human world. And then the, the heart is not being uh, harassed. So we're not being harassed in nature. We're just being there with this neutral and non-judgmental elements. And so then the heart comes alive and then we, we suddenly get a flood of affection and appreciation for nature. So that's, that's how that is happening, and very good. And we should never be walking around out in nature thinking that this is just a mere matter, mere materiality, just a resource to be used. And this is uh, part of the modern West, is that we saw forests and uh, as just firewood and uh, uh, buildings and uh, just as re resources. Earlier cultures didn't see it that way. They, they saw it as an affectionate friend that, that had a relationship to you, that provided for you, and uh, that you had a, a genuine affection for that. And that uh, the scientific technological attitude has emptied that out, and you will indeed end up as an empty, <laughs> empty person if you think uh, only in terms of the, the chemistry table or just physics. It's much more alive and uh, uh, related to humans than that. And so uh, it's, it, it works its magic. Um, one of the things that uh, Ajahn Viridamo says uh, about nature is to make the trees come to you. And what does he mean by that? Sometimes we go out looking for solace and support and and joy in nature, but it turns out to be a sterile experience. We just feel lonely. And we were disappointed that nature didn't do its magic. <clears throat> but you went out there, in na if you go out into nature as needy, the trees run away. There is no magic. You have to go, you have to fill yourself, feel peaceful, and the moment you do, then the magic of the trees, the friendliness of the trees comes back. And the trees, then as you walk under them, they stroke your head. And the snow sings to you. Uh, the sky celebrates. So this is how you do it. You enliven nature by enlivening yourself. And then there's this, there's a mirror between you and nature. There's a mirror between you and the snow. The snow is reflecting back your own heart, which is not being harassed. Then you can take that back, and then you can start with objects that are easy, your cat and the birds, and then work on the more complex beings called humans. And so, yes, many people find that nature is the place as, and monks, of course, are encouraged by the, the Buddha to live in the forest, dwell in the forest, O monks, stay in the forest, practice in the forests, because the forest is a much less uh, uh, active kind of element. It's a neutral, much more neutral element, and you can generate some of these more delicate emotions. Here in the midst of a shouting group of people who are all elbowing each other, trying to get something in, in a dog-eat-dog -dog kind of competitive world, it's very hard to, to get these fine feelings. So nature allows that. It's the backdrop. It's kind of a neutral backdrop for that. But notice that uh, some people are afraid or resistant uh, to go to nature because they, all they feel is empty and, and uh, uh, alone in nature. And that's what they, they have to recognize, that they, uh, they themselves generate the beauty of nature. It comes out of them and then bounces back towards them. So yes, this is a very insightful area, and I, I encourage all the others who are listening to explore your relationship to nature. And you will find when you leave the human realm and just go into the uh, nature itself, you will be confronted with yourself much more acutely. And can you make the trees come to you? 
You see this with the cats as well. When you need the cat, when you want the cat to come and purr in your lap, the cat runs away. <laughs> cat wants nothing to do with you. You're needy. <laughs> cats have no, they don't like needy people. <laughs> but when, when you don't care about the cat, you're full of joy and ease, the cat loves to sit on your lap and purr away just for hours. So understand that relationship. You and nature, you and the cats, you and humans. Later on, we'll talk in the 11 benefits of loving kindness that one of the, uh, one of the results of loving kindness is that one becomes affectionate to human beings and one becomes affectionate to non-human beings as well. What are non-human beings? Cats, birds, dogs, trees. <laughs> yes, the entire world. Uh, feels as if you are a friend to it. Our next question is from Will K. in Oberlin, United States. Will, ask, we're ready for you to ask Ajahn your question. Thank you. Um, Ajahn, it has struck me that uh, this feeling of metta cannot be forced, and yet uh, it requires a great amount of intention and energy and effort to cultivate it powerfully. So I'm wondering what the, the middle way is or what the right balance is uh, to approach this practice to cultivate this feeling powerfully without ending up trying to force it. Thank you. Well, I, this is the same with any art, actually. Uh, when a writer stares at the blank piece of paper can you force a great novel out of yourself? Uh, no, but means does it mean that you can't write? No, it means that you must stare at that blank paper until something gets down there. Some form of a sentence gets put down there. Something, some beginning is made. And various writers and musicians, etc., they have their ways of trying to wait for the muse to come to them and to 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 open themselves to that. And so that you, you have to use with loving kindness is it's the fine art of loving kindness. It's an art and a craft. And you have to, uh, as I was talking about with music, at first you have to play notes. So you, you sit down and you start talking to yourself. You start using your memory, memory which has some uh, warm, affectionate uh, experiences. Uh, of from people, from animals, uh, having seen other people, be kind to each other, flood, bring up the memories. Then you can use your imagination as well. So this is very juicy. Uh, breath meditation, for instance, asks you stop thinking, don't remember, don't imagine. Loving kindness, on the other hand, is a very wonderful, warm and juicy practice where you can indulge in your memories and your imagination, but not just any memory, not just any imagination. It has to be on the subject of profound kindness and goodwill. And now you might need a little stimulus. Read Charles Dickens. Let, let him open your heart with Oliver Twist, some eight-year-old abandoned on the streets of London. See how, what that feels like. By the way, these great artists, you know, they, they're the ones that make great social change by focusing on it, what it feels like as an individual. Uh, they, they, they allow the, the ordinary person doesn't have much imagination, doesn't have much empathy, and they, they don't uh, see unless they're seeing through the eyes of somebody who does have these things. So the Buddha is saying, you know, the way I see beings is much more uh, compassionately than ordinary people. You, you must understand that how, what beings feel like. And so he's pulling you into this. And so we, you can use any great literature or great poetry, uh, music, etc. to bring you into this reality of what it feels like to be a, a living being on this uh, in this life on this planet. And then your 
whatever degree th that you have of this capacity for compassion will be enriched and start to flower. And then you, you start to develop yourself. And you, the more you read, the more you reflect, the more you listen, and the more you hang out with people who are uh, responding compassionately to the full depths of what it is to be a, a, a being on this planet, especially a human being, then you also will pick up the art. It will be transferred to you. You will, you're in the milieu of this, this fine art and skill. And also if you hang around with very calloused and uncompassionate people, you, you tend to get brutalized by that. So you see groups of criminals and sometimes soldiers and so forth who lose their sense of humanity. And then other groups that are full of humanity. And then when you, you all, simply by being in their presence, you become more humane and uh, open the heart. And you have an, enrich, an enriched experience of life. So this is a very, it's wide open to how to make this begin to flow. And as, this, as you say, it's not about force, it's about ingenuity, and it's about inspiration and creativity. And you have to find your way to it, and some things do it for you. And of course, the voice of another, or even reading the, the words of the Buddha, they're very moving. But uh, whatever works for you is, and it doesn't have to start at the, uh, as a, uh, a masterpiece, it, it needs, not all things, not all loving kindness is a masterpiece, but even if it's a, a little spark uh, flowing through you, that it's uh, already extremely valuable and activating circuits that are need cultivation. So this is the beginning of great things. Our next question is from Brian H. in Penticton, Canada. Do you need to be a Buddhist in order to receive or radiate metta, and does speaking Pali help in the process? Well, you do not need to be a Buddhist to radiate metta. metta and we, we encourage people from every, any philosophy or any religion to please indulge. We, this, is a, this is not our secret. This is not our treasure. You don't have to join a club. <laughs> and then... You know, there are religions where you have to kind of uh, pledge and, you know, you join the religion and you get into heaven. <laughs> this is a, Buddhism doesn't, you can claim you're a Buddhist, you can bow a thousand times to the, the triple gem and everything, it still doesn't work. If What, what, is, uh, what is Buddhism is, is, a, is a condition of consciousness. How is your heart? You, you are admitted to well-being through your heart and no other by no other means you can't join a club <laughs> buddhism won't let you join any club <laughs> you you enter this through your consciousness and your heart and your goodwill and there's no other way to enter it it's just like entering a math class you can't be, because you say you love math and even if you say i, I you you can do math if you can't do math, it doesn't matter whether you love it, or you say you love it, or you say you like it, or you say you're good, it's not math. <laughs> so loving kindness is universally available to any being. Um, and sec uh, Pali, of course, is uh, an ancient language, which is pretty well expired now. It's best, best before date has come and gone. Nobody really speaks it anymore, but it's at the root of a few things. It's like Latin or Greek. It's at the root of some languages. There are a few words in Pali that are missing in English. And so I try to make sure that I use English words. And the few words that, are, that have no English equivalents, I try to, if I use the Pali, like metta, I usually provide it with a 10 days of hour-long hour talks to explain what I mean by this single word, metta. <laughs> so that occasionally I might refer to, to a Pali word, but I always uh, add on an English uh, equivalent 
uh, and sometimes it takes a, a few sentences to get something equivalent in English. In uh, the Buddhist countries, uh, Pali has a resonance because people are raised around it, and uh, it, it's a kind of like a sacred or holy thing. It, it has an emotional impact. But in the West, it really doesn't. So um, I, I make sure that I try to be fully uh, uh, explain this. When you get Asian monks who are raised in that culture coming to the West, quite often they make the mistake of babbling away sentence after sentence in Pali or whole phrases, and it just does not have that communication structure to it. So we have to understand we're in a different culture, not only is this a different culture, this is a different time, and this is modernity. And so we have to go to the, the greatest extent to communicate uh, through language, but also the fact that uh, not only am I not talking in Pali, but I am using the Internet. <laughs> uh, I, not only, I've, we've gone beyond books, now we're into videos and just transmitting our, our words all over the planet. So we will do anything we can to communicate, and communication is all that matters. Ajahn, our next question is from Mary S. in Bellingham, USA. Thank you, Ajahn Sona, for your teachings and beautiful chanting. In your second Dhamma talk, The Path to Profound Friendliness, you said that one has a better chance with metta if one knows that it's a component of the Eightfold Path, can you please say more about that? Thank you. Yes. Uh, now, this means that metta, uh, there is, we, just the previous question, somebody asked me, do you have to be a Buddhist to practice metta? No. But if you're a Buddhist, is metta enough? No. <laughs> uh, if you want to attain to the highest possible understanding of things, Metta is a very good means to an end, but there are certain uh, information that you must have in order to attain the highest goal. And you will see at the end of the Metta Sutta, uh, coming in a couple of days or so, <laughs> uh, and, and also the, the 11 benefits of loving kindness, right at the end of both of those suttas, they talk about this possibilities of the results of loving kindness, pure loving kindness, but also the uh, alternative result of the attainment of Nibbana. Uh, both of these are extraordinarily positive results, Nibbana being the highest possible, the, the highest benefit. A loving kindness being within the possibilities of, of samsara, being the most valuable uh, treasure that you can encounter. So it, if one wants to have the full uh, Buddhist uh, view of things, then one needs to incorporate loving-kindness into the Eightfold Path. Yeah. Our next question is from Anonymous in Victoria, Canada. Ajahn, I have a family member, a daughter-in-law, who calls me names suddenly turns viciously on me whenever we get closer, and for years now has de denied me access to my grandchildren. There is mental illness. My only son has withdrawn. I made the decision to let them go. Though it is heartbreaking, this situation is the source of too much pain in my life. I am trying to find that sweet spot of loving them without wanting anything back. However, I feel familial love is always conditional on being treated respectfully and has attachment. I have grown to see I must continuously give my broken heart metta. I love being happy, but don't want to brush off my broken heart. What do you suggest? I suggest that you change your mind and brush off your broken heart <laughs> <laughs> and indulge deeply in loving kindness. And, you know, if, if it's hard to practice loving kindness towards your family, the, uh, who have uh, bizarre views, etc. Don't worry about it. Uh, there are plenty of other beings in the universe to practice loving kindness to. And if you keep this up and uh, expand yourself, eventually you'll be able to um, encompass them with loving kindness as well. 
without any concern for what, how they, how they feel about you or whether they return it or anything like that. You don't, there's no return necessary. Uh, <clears throat> you, you are the beneficiary immediately of this. And, uh, so this is, again, I think in the first question, I, I said, there's a strange kind of illogic a lack of sense in the culture that we were we somehow want to anything that bubbles up in our mind we're supposed to somehow honor it and and sort of hold these difficult painful emotions bad idea like please that that kind of thinking is from lesser lesser minds People will tell you that stuff. People with with uh, accredited degrees <laughs> in various things, please dismiss them. <laughs> Say, look, I I'm sure you want to help me, but you're really not that wise. <laughs> I uh, I prefer to listen to the Buddha, and he the Buddha is not interested in you <laughs> suffering or indulging these emotions. So what the, what's the benefit of this? What do you think is going to happen? If you don't deal clearly with, with these things, put them aside, move on to positive structures, you'll be uh, experiencing this for the rest of your life. Unnecessarily. You can retrain your mind. You can tell it what you want to hear and what you don't want to hear, what you want to see and what you don't want to see. You're not obliged to just sit through the movie, whatever plays. You can just walk out of the theater. Please do. Ask for your money back, too. <laughs> yeah. Our next question is from Anonymous in Falkland, Canada. Do you have an example of a common or often mis- used application of metta, which can be referred to as, quote, akusala, which we should avoid. Yeah, metta has a, what's called a near enemy. And this is the, the they're very, more or less, these are the commentarial um, teachings on, on the sublime abidings of, of loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. And each of those has a what's called a near enemy, one that comes in the disguise of, and then they have a far enemy, one that is the opposite of. So the opposite of loving kindness is obviously hate. <laughs> uh, but there's one that comes in the disguise of, and that's love which is conditional and attached. And so you, you love somebody or something but it's because of the that they qualify somehow. You, you like the way they look. You you like what they they give you gifts. Uh, they they you like the way they sound, the way they smell, the way they walk, or they, you know that they're smart or something like this. Is these are uh, that's conditional loving kindness, and so it has its its problems because if that person changes loses the quality that you like, then it turns out you don't really have loving kindness towards them. So that's one of the dangers. The other one is um, that actually as you become a very loving person, uh, you can, uh, you become more attractive to people. And then if you're not, if your loving kindness and your morality is not highly developed, you can end up manipulating people because they're they're attracted to your loving kindness, and then you you have low kind of uh, motives, and so you you take advantage of them. So this is something that can happen. Also, romantic love can come out of you initiate loving kindness, and then it turns into the to romantic love which is a lower condition of this. And this is, this is something one has to be careful of because very, uh, most humans are, the highest they can imagine is kind of a rom romantic love, but it's, it's a, the loving kindness itself is a kind of a power that you have. And uh, it needs to be held in a very ethical way, very carefully, so that it doesn't turn into these other things that are a kusala, 
uh, unskillful. Glad you used the word akusla again. We'll, by the time the 10, re, 10 days retreat, we're going to know about six poly words. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Excellent. Our next question is from Anonymous in Oberlin, United States. Can you comment on spiritual conceit? I know it is not skillful to cling to progress made on the path, but still thoughts arise of comparing myself to others. I can acknowledge that the progress is not me or mine, but still this idea of, quote, better than persists. How to work with this and let it go? Well, it's all right, actually. Uh, a spiritual conceit uh, is a natural byproduct of of uh, your progress. And it actually does not disappear until the fourth stage of enlightenment. The, even in the third stage of enlightenment, one of the fetters that remain is a sense of conceit, a slight sense of self. The after, the after odor of self. The self has been seen through, but there's still a, a, an abiding slight smell um, which is not being completely removed. Um, uh, Ajahn Jyotipalo to yesterday got diesel all over his, all over his robes. <laughs> and he, he washed, and I've done this <laughs> several times myself, diesel. It's very hard to get out of your clothes, the smell. <laughs> anyway, you can wash it, and you should. You wash it, and you wash it, and you wash it, and then after it's clean and clean and clean, there's still a kind of a, a remaining smell. So we have a strategy which we're undertaking, and that is we're, we make up a bunch of uh, cedar shavings, and then we put the cloth in, in a box with the cedar shavings, hoping that it will extract the final smell <laughs> of diesel. You can think of diesel as conceit. <laughs> diesel and conceit. Uh, the smell, the slight smell of, of self and conceit uh, is very hard to remove, and it's only in the final stage of enlightenment where it completely is gone. So there are, there are three things which an arahant doesn't think. Three things. Arahant is, is finished with the conceit. He, he or she does not think. I am better than you. Second, I am less than you. And let's guess what the third one is. I am equal to you. Now, there's an interesting thought because a lot of people, especially in the West, they're very much into this equality thing. Everybody's supposed to be equal, eh, eh, democracy, etc. What does the Arahant not think? I am equal to you. That's still a comparison. We're equal. No, we're not equal. I'm not better than you. I'm not lesser than you. And I'm not equal to you. Because all of them are types of comparisons. Is a pine tree better than a willow tree? Like, it, even the, the, the question is absurd. Is it better? Oh, then it must be worse. No, it's not worse? Oh, it, they're equal, I see. No. Willow trees and pine trees are not equal. A pine tree is a pine tree is a pine tree. A willow tree is a willow tree is a willow tree. And a rose is a rose is a rose. So we're not, we're not comparable, actually. There is nothing to compare. We are unique beings because of causes and effects that play, have played out in our life and in nobody else's life, and we are what we are. And there's nothing to compare. So eventually, we should get to that stage. When you stop formulating the whole idea around the self, then uh, wh who are you comparing to what? <laughs> so it's like uh, comparing unicorns to winged griffins. You know, uh, like who's better, winged griffin or unicorn? I remember the a, a conversation from the movie, uh, what was the movie? Um, stand, uh, what is it? Uh, stand by me, stand by me. Yes. Now there's two kids walking around. They're, they're going off to see a dead body. 
They've heard there's a dead body and they're walking. They decided to make a little trip. There's three or four of them and they made a walk along the railroad tracks to go and see a dead body. And on the way, they're having conversations, which eight-year-olds do. So one of the eight-year-olds suddenly, I think there's an eight-year-old and a nine-year-old. The eight-year-old says, if Mighty Mouse and Superman had a fight, who do you think would win? The nine-year-old said, what are you, crazy? Mighty Mouse is a cartoon. Superman's a real guy. (laughs) And then the eight-year-old tries to process this for a while, and he says, yeah, but still, who would win? (laughs) So uh, this idea of the self is like (laughs) Mighty Mouse and Superman, neither of them (laughs) are real guys. (laughs) So they're not going to have a fight and no, you're never going to find out who wins. And so the same with the self. There, there are no selves. So nobody, the idea of one that's better, worse, or equal, are Mighty Mouse and Superman equal? Or is one better? <laughs> None of those things pertain. <laughs> so there we go. <clears throat> and I'm glad that I dredged stand by me above from my memory. <laughs> Our next question is from Anonymous in Redmond, United States. First of all, I would like to express my profound gratitude to everyone who has made this virtual retreat possible and for Ajahn Sona for patiently explaining everything in depth. This is a gift brought by the pandemic. I have a very basic question. All of this loving kindness practice is for ultimately leading a virtuous life. What is the need to lead a virtuous life, Ajahn? Many who do not practice any of the higher qualities seem to have a good enough life without ever regretting any aspect of it. Those who practice these qualities have to work at them, struggle in their dealings with other people, and eventually may not even lead comfortable lives. This path seems to be riddled with so many hurdles and compromises and whatnot. Are we to follow this path with the hopes of a better life, maybe in our next birth? What does trying to lead a virtuous life give us? I think that uh, you might be mistaken about the people having a good experience without any practice or et cetera. I, I think that they themselves, even if you ask them, how's your life been? And they say, oh, it's great. It's fine and everything. Basically, they're, it's like asking a tone deaf person about a great piece of music, you know. They're reporting it randomly. They really don't know themselves. They don't know their emotional lack or they're just spouting some words. It's like asking somebody if they're healthy and then, you know, they drop dead the next day. <laughs> they got a t- they're heavily overweight. They have palpitations of the heart. They have blood, high blood pressure, they have diabetes and everything. They, yeah. Oh, I'm fine. <laughs> they just don't know. So the average person is is so far out of the, cap- the capacity to even evaluate what it means to feel well, that you should not take their self-report, their anecdotal report about how they feel as valid at all. They, they really are unable to report properly. And so, and you will see that people who are seem to be happy. They go 20 years, the, everything around them is fine, the relationships, and the, they seem to get by and everything. And then one day, just one thing happens. Somebody dies. Somebody loses a job. The house burns down. There's a car accident. Somebody has a, a stroke. Somebody falls down and hurts themselves. You lose, you lose something. You lose a pet. You lose a a child, you lose a, a, a friend, and then you will see all the beginning of unraveling. And it means that the, the so-called, their sense of well-being and happiness is very, very shaky. And all it requires is a few things to go wrong, and it all just comes apart. So that's a very dangerous way to live. And they cannot self-report on that. Hey, they'll tell you, I'm all right, Jack. <laughs> they don't know what's going to happen to them. That's, that's uh, Socrates or Plato, 
famous saying, the unexamined life is not worth living. And, and you're, you're very vulnerable and prone to disastrous results if you don't inquire and work at this ahead of time. You need to do your preparation. You know, if you don't, you can't swim and you're messing around at the edge of the river and then you just happen to go in, it's a real tragedy. Um, but if you can swim, it's not a tragedy. So this is this is the, the, the true nature of this. And the, the fact that a bunch of us have to stay in and practice the violin while everybody else plays baseball <laughs> is... Uh, is not that why do I have to do it and everybody else doesn't. It's because you care about yourself and you, you intuit that there is something to gain, there is something to be improved, and that if it takes work, what else have you got to do? And again, it is the actual real work. This is why you're here, is to do this work. And I'm sorry there is no easy shortcut. Some religions seem to offer you a easy shortcut. I don't believe it. You, it's something you have to do by your own efforts and your own inquiry. And uh, there's just no way around it. And uh, so we have to face that. And, and by the way, it can be. <laughs> there is suffering that leads to happiness. <laughs> and quite often, a even a a 10-day meditation retreat with your knees screaming at you and being hungry at night <laughs> is suffering. <laughs> but eventually, it pays off in the end. The work pays off in the end. And the, the work has to be done. There's various types of characters. Um, the Buddha talks about four different types of, of spiritual experience. The first one is one... Um, is it's it's pleasant and you get results quickly. The second level is it's pleasant but slow. <laughs> Third one is it's painful but short. <laughs> and the third the fourth one is it's painful and it takes a long time. <laughs> now the Buddha is just laying out the reality of it. it just so for some people, it's a, it is a long, hard struggle. Others are top of the class. Now, this happens in every walk of life. You uh, Go into a grade three class with 30 kids in the class, and you'll find one, one, a few of them at the top there. It's just a breeze for them. They learn like nothing, and it's pleasant. And then there's the poor kid in the back, Johnny, <laughs> the famous Johnny, who is just... It's dreadfully hard and doesn't get it and it takes him a long time and he has to repeat the grade and so forth. And that's just the way the human curve is. And it, it is that way in the spiritual life as well. But nevertheless, we have to make our effort. John, this next question is from Nang in Vancouver, Canada. You said that the Buddha did not react to horrors of the world because he recognized that the world is full of horrors samsara, 24-7. Given this, my question is whether we should use our time and energy to make the world a better place, for example, working to control climate change or fighting racism? Uh, yeah, they're not mutually exclusive. We can actually do uh, positive things for the world, uh, but we shouldn't ever... Buddhists basically should eventually get the big view of things that, you know, these are all temporary and bandages uh, and... Bandages are very ha necessary. I mean, eventually you have to die anyway, so should you not use bandages? <laughs> no, no aspirin, no bandages, because you're going to die eventually? No. You use bandages and aspirin to make the situation better, get some exercise, eat right, etc., uh, contribute to uh, good social causes and so forth. But you're under no illusion that somehow this is going to fix everything forever and everybody's going to live happily ever after. It doesn't work that way. Uh, but nevertheless, it's, uh, it's fine. You make some positive energy by, by uh, contributing to the well-being of other uh, beings. You, you delight in the generosity of your gifts and your, uh, your acting out of compassion. And, but you, you have this wise thing behind you because lots of uh, social activists burn out 
and they become depressed. Social, social activism and uh, uh, ec ecological activism as well. Uh, if you don't have the big view of things and do this with detachment and uh, just generosity and cheer, good cheer, then uh, you will burn out. And so you see many people with good hearts that are uh, very active. Uh, if they do not understand this, it just is a matter of time till they become de depressed because these things often fail and people don't listen, etc. So it's excellent if you can get the larger view. You will never run out of energy. You will be, uh, be able to contribute to the uh, ecological ac actions, the social actions for the rest of your life, but you will never feel that you failed somehow or anything because you don't, you don't have those kind of ideas about f success and failure. All of these social conditions are temporary and they, you win some and you lose some and then the one that you won turns into a disaster and then the disaster turns into a good thing and there's a back and forth. You're able to stand aside, see the big picture and remain equanimous and compassionate and even humorous. <laughs> you can keep your sense of humor in the midst of this. And so it is uh, entirely uh, possible to, to do these things. But do not neglect the opportunity from time to time to retreat, to leave the social dimension behind, go into quiet solitude, and uh, cultivate the higher possibilities of the human mind. Because there will be plenty of uh, social warriors left out there to keep going while you're mysteriously absent for 10 days. <laughs> and you will come back refreshed and perhaps able to share some secrets of how to keep going with them as well. Our next question is from Anna B. in Cuneo, Italy. My question refers to talk number three. The story of Angulimala can be very inspiring, but how true can it be considering the way memory works? I haven't killed anybody, though the memories of actions, words, and thoughts dictated from anger keep coming back before anything else. How does one become consistent in the recollection of one's own good actions? Or is the relationship to those memories and their substitution the key? Thank you so much for all your efforts to make the, your retreats available all over the world. Yes. Angulimala is a special case. And of course, um, he's uh, often everybody's favorite saint because no matter what you've done in life, it's never been as bad as Angulimala. And he ends up as an arahant. He's a <laughs> perfect saint. <laughs> Sleeps like a baby. And it's because uh, he is free from uh, all of those motives. And so... When, you know, the things that you said and did, which you disapprove of now, you wouldn't do it again. As long as you wouldn't do it again, you, what, what do you feel guilty about? You're not, you're not that person anymore. You, were, you said those things and did those things because you didn't know any better. You're ignorant, you're unskillful. Well, you aren't anymore. Now, notice that there's various stages in life, like some people love to talk about the stupid things they did when they were a teenager, but not when they're... 30. <laughs> they can't, they're still embarrassed about the things they did when they were 30, but they can laugh about the stuff they did when they're 15. Some people are too embarrassed to talk about when they, what they did at 15, but you can, you can manage, you can manage to talk about it before you were three. So you, you know, you peed on the floor or under the table when you were two and so forth. And ha ha ha, because you're not a two-year-old anymore. And two-year-olds do that. But actually, at any stage of our life, we should be able to talk about something that we see now as unskillful or foolish with mere mirth, because we are no longer that person. And it, even if you were 60 when you did it. <laughs> uh, so you, you make transformations, you grow, you understand. And we do this with all kinds of things. We, when we've we're trying to figure out how to use a computer and we make this gross mistake with it and so forth. And then we're talking to a friend a month later after we've learned all of the things. We think, you know, I was so idiotic that I, you know, pressed this button and that button at the same time and fried the whole thing. So um, 
this is just the nature of learning. And you, you learn something and you're free. You're, you're no longer responsible for ignorance that was once there. It's gone. And so don't put yourself, you're not actually that person. Think of it as your younger sister. So when you, you can talk to other people about this, whatever it is you said and did, and you say, my, my, my younger sister said and did this very unskillful thing, and you, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Even though it was, theoretically, they say that that's you, but it's actually <clears throat> almost another person. So you got to get this. This is a very Buddhist uh, practice that you need to, to have, is to disengage from previous personalities, because they are just a whole kind of series of all, all of them illusory, all of them just manifestations of lack of skill and ignorance. None of them real, just characters in a story. And that's all they are. Why go back and feel embarrassed about it or angry about it or hurt about it, sad about it? Because it's just, it's just, a bit, it's just figments of your imagination. That's all it is, characters in a story.